My project is intelligent energy usage in the home. So essentially, if any of these systems are drawn out of their perfect synchrony, what's called vocal, a vocal dysfunction occurs. So in 1998, the NCA implemented a bat testing protocol to try to limit the performance and control the safety of metal bats. So I'm going to be studying decoding language processing using magnetose and philography. Um, my project is about the relationship between early sexual initiation and um, eventual drug abuse in high-risk adolescents. Could you tell us a little bit about the uh, science fair here? Absolutely. What you're seeing here is you're seeing the Original Science Research re Symposium, our annual symposium, where all these kids, my sophomores, my juniors, and my seniors, are presenting the work that they're doing over three years. And what each kid is doing is they're presenting a project on some area of science that they're particularly interested in, that they researched, that they got a professional mentor to work with them, and they conducted an entire project from beginning to end, starting with the literature search, moving on to designing a project, carrying it out, finding results, and then finally presenting it publicly, both here and then at research competitions, like the International Science and Engineering Fair, the Intel Science Talent Search, and the Westchester Science and Engineering Fair. So these kids have been around uh, presenting their work in a lot of places and done a lot of really hard work and in a lot of... What's up, What's your project about? Okay. So um, my project is intelligent energy usage in the home and nowadays people spend a lot of money on heating and cooling their houses but um, lately most of the energy has been kind of leaking through the house and you're wasting your money. So what I did is I took an infrared camera, mounted it on a robot and took pictures of the house to see where we're losing energy and then we would insulate these areas and find out how we can um, help save money and help keep the heat inside so you wouldn't have to spend as much money on your heating and cooling. So Becca, what's your project about? Um, my project is about the relationship between early sexual initiation and um, eventual drug abuse in high-risk adolescents. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, well, in layman's terms, it basically means that it, I'm trying to address the correlation between um, like early sexual, like when you have sex earlier, it would lead to um, higher drug use, and not just in like every teenager, um, but more in the high-risk adolescents, which would mean um, parental problems or peer, like strong, strong peer influence or like living in a very troubled environment. Cool. Thanks, Becca. No problem, Adam. So the NCA uses aluminum bats, and they've been using them since 1974. But over this time period, both the batting average of the players have increased by 39 points, which is a very significant difference. And pitchers have accounted for 26% of all um, severe batted ball injuries. So in 1998, the NCA implemented a bat testing protocol to try to limit the performance and control the safety of metal bats. But the issue with what their study was, with their study, they didn't take into account the weight distribution of the bats. So they, the, the way they monitored it was they only proved that when uh, when an aluminum bat and a wood bat are swung at the same speed, they'll be able to, they'll produce the same result. And because a wood bat is hollow, I mean a wood bat is solid, made out of solid wood, and an aluminum bat is hollow, the manufacturer can manipulate an aluminum bat's weight distribution to allow for an easier swing speed. What they normally do is they put, um, they add weight to this part, to the handle of the bat, so that um, it moves these, um, the weight distribution and the center of gravity closer to the batter's hands, so they have greater control of the bat, and the, they, they, it requires them less force to rotate the bat or s to swing it. And so the way I, I, test, I, I did my test was I had um, players on the high school team swing aluminum bats and wood bats um, into a, a radar gun, and I measured their speeds. And they swung the mat, typically swung the metal bats about 10% faster than they swung the wood bats. And so I then went and used the NCAA testing protocol again using the swing speeds I had found. And it showed that when real players use, use these bats, they, they produce swing, um, they hit the ball about 10% harder with metal bats. So this year what I did was I contacted the Rawlings Sporting Goods Company 
and um, I came up with the design where you put the weight of the bat, you, you put the added weight towards the middle of the bat, and therefore um, the weight distribution is closer to that of the wood bat, and it would, it would hopefully allow for a more similar swing speed. And so this year I've been testing with the baseball team, comparing the swings with this metal bat to that of the wood, and their swings, the difference in their swing speed has been less than about 1%, meaning that when the weight distribution of a metal bat and wood bat are the same, they will perform similarly and therefore be equally safe. Um, so I'm going to be studying decoding language processing using magnetosencephalography, or MEG. Um, which is a neuroimaging technique um, used to elicit brain waves that code for language processing. And um, neurolinguistics is a branch of cognitive science concerned with the neural bases underlying language processing. And I'm going to be working at the neurolinguistics lab at NYU um, with my mentor, Lena Pilkinen. Um, and basically, what I'm going to be studying is the processing of language. Um, using MEG, and MEG is non-invasive, um, it's not radioactive, it doesn't um, use radiation at all, and basically the MEG technology that I'll be using at NYU um, in their lab is has 149 sensors which are hooked up to the brain, um, and there are very many different types of studies. I participated in a study where I had to read um, words and look at pictures and decide if the pictures match the words um, and a lot went into that and different brain waves were elicited such as this so yeah well uh, my project is titled sensitivity of various imaging modalities for detecting soft tissue calcium uh, and the purpose of my experiment was to discover which out of four imaging modalities in the process of radiology which is x-ray ct scan mri and ultrasound are most effective for discovering calcium deposits. And what calcium deposits are, are their side effects of various diseases, uh, like tumors, um, autoimmune diseases like lupus and scleroderma. And the significance of this is that if you find the calcium deposit, you find the disease. So I wanted to determine which out of the four modalities are most sensitive for discovering these deposits. Thanks. Um, the presentations will follow a certain order. After Jake presents, there will be a five-minute question period and then a five-minute passing time. So you can go in and out of the room after the presentation, get snacks, use the bathroom. Um, just to repeat what Mr. Garbarino was saying earlier, it's important that both rooms stay synchronized. Um, if our room finishes before the other room, then you are allowed to leave the room for snacks, but please do not enter the room that has not finished yet. Once the second room is finished, then the five-minute passing time will begin. Um, <coughs> Can everyone please silence their cell phones? Um, we will start with Jay's project entitled um, The Effects of Clothing Brands and Styles on Teenagers' Perceptions of Others. Hello, my name is Jade Mandel, and my project is The Effects of Clothing Brands and Styles on Teenagers' Perceptions of Others. Prior to this current economic recession, the clothing and shoe industry was actually quite booming. In the year 2006, the clothing and shoe industry amounted to over $357.2 billion just on clothing and shoes. So there has to be underlying factors that are causing consumers to go out and spend such a large part of their income. There are three major influences in clothing choices, cultural, economic, and social. Cultural deals with their, uh, their background, where they come from, economic, how much, they, um, how much their income is, and social, uh, their friends, and how that affects them. There are many things involved in a person's fashion choice, such as priorities between fashion and comfort, hobbies or personal interests, and their concept of self-expression, how they express themselves through what they're wearing. I chose to study teenagers because one, I had in Maranek High School as my source of research, and teenagers are a consumer transition, where they're transitioning from their parents buying their clothing to them going out to the stores and purchasing using their own money and making their own decisions. There are many underlying societal factors that cause consumers to buy clothing and shoes that can be studied through the field of consumer behavior. Consumer behavior is defined as um, the dynamic interaction of effect and cognition uh, and environmental events by which human beings conduct the exchange aspects of their lives. So I decided to study this through my hypothesis. My hypothesis was teenagers will judge other people's clothing styles and initially associate with people based on similar fashion tastes and stereotypes against certain brands and or staff. As I said before, consumer behavior. You study consumer behavior through the field of consumer psychology, which is uh, broken up into two fields, cognition and social. Cognition deals with 
uh, the concept of ego involvement, uh, which is basically the relationship between a person and an individual uh, and an issue or an object. Uh, the other part of it is social, which individuals identify themselves, and it's how they basically uh, find themselves and they associate with themselves through a group. Basically, you combine these two fields and it makes up consumer psychology. For my research, I broke it up into two methods, qualitative and quantitative. The qualitative method was I had interviews with subjects at Mamanic High School, personal interviews where I got real life experiences of how people were affected by clothing in their lives, and these are specific examples. And the other part of my research was quantitative, where I gave out surveys to students at the school, and I got general uh, views about clothing. My quantitative method, I wanted to get a very unbiased group of subjects. Therefore, I divided the four grades up into academic level, so that I got from bio to chem to physics to the senior choices. So I had every academic level, from the applied classes to the AP classes. I then handed out over 250 subject surveys, and I only got back 50 that I could analyze, and I broke them up into these categories. When I got the uh, surveys back, I analyzed them. The surveys were used with a Likert scale, which basically goes from strongly disagree to strongly agree, with a scale of 1 to 5. The surveys were randomly selected, and um, on, the, on the surveys I have made sure that I had a broad view of each grade, gender, and academic level. The names were kept confidential, I never saw the names, they were covered by the time I had it, but their parents did have to sign uh, consent for them to fill out the survey. They were asked to circle the phrase that best describes yourself and your purchasing habits. For the qualitative method, to obtain my subjects, I use the method of quota selection, which is you take an arbitrary number, you first divide it into categories, and then you take an arbitrary number from each category in order to get an unbiased, varied group of subjects. I handed out 100 free surveys at a big cell to students, which every student passes by during their day. Then I sorted them into these eight categories of pulling cells. These are the eight categories. Athletic, heavy metal, hippie, indie, punk, urban, relaxed, and heavy. To get these categories, I went around the school and asked people, how do you describe your style? I took the eight that I got the most of, and I decided those were my categories. When I went into my interviews, I made sure that I had at least one of each category, and then I put in two more relaxed, because I had an overwhelming amount of people say that their style was relaxed. So in my qualitative method, I had interviews with these subjects. Ten minute interviews where I really wanted personal life experiences. How clothing and specifically impacted them. The reasons for specific ch uh, style choices in their lives, perceptions of lifestyles that correlate with certain brands, judgments of other students based on their style, gender differences in clothing, and overall opinion of other students based on how they dress. Uh, and now to the quantitative aspect of my study. This is where I ended up the surveys, 200, 250, and I analyzed 50. What I ended up analyzing was the difference between male and female responses. In clothing, you would probably expect the, uh, girls would show a very higher involvement in their clothing choices. However, of the 13 questions, only four of these questions, which are shown in red and yellow, uh, had a significant difference between females and males. Significant difference means that if I were to perform this, uh, the ones in red are highly significant. This is if I perform this experiment 100 times, 99 out of those times, I would get this, I would probably get this experiment result again. Yellow, if I did this 100 times, I would get it 95 times again. Because when you compare the answers, there's a point oh, it's less than point oh one, which is shown by the numbers right there. Now, of the four questions that were significant, these questions were, uh, I expressed individuality through my clothing, I spent more, a lot of time preparing my outfits, clothing is important to me, and fashion is more important than clothing. It's more important than comfort. These are the four questions that showed a higher value with Females. This shows that um, females have a higher clothing involvement. So of these four questions, these are the ones significant. However, nine of the other questions show no significant difference between female and females. Of the qualitative aspects, these were the specific results that I got. Um, I got some interesting responses when I asked questions. For example, uh, do you judge people based on clothing? A girl responds, no, not unless they're mean. Kind of pushing themselves away from it, saying, nope, I don't do that. The other person said, oh yeah, definitely, people, other people judge. I'm not trying to make myself sound like safe, but yeah, other people do it. I don't judge people a book by its cover. And then another one said, I don't think judge is the right word, because you get to know someone, and then before you judge them. So this explains why, on these survey questions, the answer, uh, one of the questions was, I judge people based on clothing. 
this question had a uh, all overall average of two, which is disagreed for males and females. Male and female both said, no, I do not judge people based on clothing. However, this uh, question, people judge people based on clothing for both male and female had the answer four, which is agreed. This basically showed that everybody was willing to say, yes, people judge me based on my clothing, but nobody's willing to say, yes, I judge people based on clothing. So basically, what can be taken from this experiment is that teenagers, boys and girls, face a lot of the same judgments based on clothing. Uh, an interesting part of the other questions that weren't significant difference between male and female was that subjects <coughs> said that they didn't associate with people based on clothing. However, in the specific interviews, I found that a lot of people said, yes, my friends dress similarly, but nobody said, I associate with people based on their clothing. So that showed that the clothing in friend groups is a lot more on a subconscious level, whether it really impacts you. So, research, on first look, this research could show that people don't judge people based on clothing, because nobody's willing to say, I judge people based on clothing. However, what I really felt was significant in my study was the fact that everybody says other people judge people based on clothing, which makes me believe whether this, whether this data is really significant, because really studying whether people really say what they really mean, yes, I judge people based on clothing, would be a very hard study to perform, because nobody really knows what people are thinking. So. For a source of error, if I was to go to another school, maybe there would be a higher probability that people would actually tell me, yes, I judge people based on clothing, because they wouldn't be afraid of, for example, seeing me in the hallway and knowing that they judge people. The other thing was the informed consent. As I said before, I handed out over 250 subjects, uh, surveys to subjects, and I only received 50 back that were I was able to analyze. And the other thing was that I only had subjects from Ameritech, New York. While Ameritech is, the high school is pretty diverse, it was only people from the north, whereas I didn't have any southern or west or other countries. So there's a lot of other ways that this, uh, this project could have been brought about. For future research, I can study this same project in an older age bracket, for example, maybe our parents, and see how that affects their friend groups and their judgments of other people, and also in this growing technology age, cell phones. So basically, in conclusion, teachers claim not to judge people based on clothing, but whether that's the truth is for you to decide. you to do this uh, research? Uh, well, initially I started studying actually in stores, consumer behavior, and how like where products uh, were placed around a store and how that affected the sales. But I decided being in a high school, it was a lot easier to kind of use the resources that we had here. And I read a study that was conducted in England, where it's just interviews with um, 12 to 13 year olds and how uh, their trainers or sneakers affected how they viewed other people. And it kind of made me, uh, I was interested in how, in our high school, in an older age bracket, just the whole clothing in general would affect friendships and judgments. I wasn't sure if I heard, did you say that not a single person admitted that they judged people based, not a single person? All right, no, no, uh, that, that was not what I said, is that um, on the scale it was from one to five, one being strongly disagree and five being strongly agree, in that when I took the male and female average, the entire average was a two, which is okay. disagree. But that by no means doesn't mean that okay. someone did say a five. But in the end, it like it showed that because there were more. Do you know if of the people who put that they did judge people based on clothing, they were more males or more females? I, I didn't look at that specifically, and that would definitely be something I would look at like later in a variable. But it was just the overall trend that uh, the, the answers for people judge and I judge were very similar for male and female, which I was not expecting. I guess I got from the qualitative, which was the interviews I got. Uh, a lot of the younger kids were really concerned, the freshmen and sophomores really talked about how they really felt like they had to impress people and how they felt they were being judged. Whereas the uh, upperclassmen that I spoke to didn't really, a lot of them didn't really think it was a bigger part of their life and didn't think that it impacted them as much as I felt came across from the underclassmen. Do you think that people uh, think that they're judging they, they don't think that they're judging others based on clothing, but they really are. Is that like something? Right, yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. And that's the annoying part of, of behavioral psychology is that it's very hard to find out what people are actually thinking. And it's, it's, there's a great difference between what they're actually thinking and what they're telling you in the interview. But. 
right, thank you.
So I ordered a printed circuit board for a device that was very similar to what I was trying to build. Um, I, just modif I just modified some of the parts that were on it. And it consists of two amplifiers, and it's actually shown in this picture here. Now what you can see, here we are. This is the piezoelectric element. This element takes sound or compression waves and turns them into electricity. This chip here is one of the amplifier stages, or it makes the signal stronger so that I can read it better. And it is then brought out through this coaxial cable here, this just standard cable that is brought out to an oscilloscope. Okay, so then the model that I uh, tested the transducer with pushes a volume of air using a piston. <coughs> this uh, piston is it's just a pneumatic piston that I made with parts that I got from Home Depot. And it's literally a household toilet plunger in a piece of PVC irrigation tubing. It's very simple to make. And the piston is pushed with a elastic latex tubing, which is drawn back to the same place every time the same volume of air is pushed. And a model of the human vocal cord is put within this ventilatory laryngeal model, model or the BLM, to simulate the presence of the human vocal cord. This is the BLM right here. As you can see, here's the pneumatic piston. This is the elastic tubing, and there's a triggering mechanism here as well. So the same amount of air is pushed every time through the simulated larynx, which you can't see right here because it's enclosed within um, this assembly. In order to um, take the measurements, I had a I had my transducer here, which was placed in different locations, which I will describe later in the presentation, um, around the model, and the um, excuse me. Uh, the transducer uh, and the circuit here uh, then outputs a signal to our oscilloscope, which is basically an electronic function generator, is then recorded on a recording computer. So as I said earlier, the transducer, the transducer was positioned for each condition, or a polyp present or no polyp present for the experiment with a postable lab lamp. The oscilloscope was then started, or the recording device was then started before I triggered the BLM, before I allowed air to be pushed through the two different larynxes, one with a polyp present, one without a polyp present. And then the data was saved as a wave file, which is just a raw waveform. It's just a sound file, basically. And it, is then, and it was then analyzed in a program known as Audacity, which is an open source audio editing software. Um, then I did, I performed a numerical analysis using a fast Fourier transform, and I took the numbers from the fast Fourier transform and analyzed them in Microsoft Excel. Okay, so for each experiment, I tested whether or not there was a nodule present, and I tested three different locations of the transducer to see what would be best for like a clinical setting. I tested super bottle, seen here, which is above the location of the larynx. Subglottal here, which is below the location of the larynx, and an oral location, which would be at the end of the patient, which would be at the patient's mouth. So just to recap, ultrasonic waves go to the piezoelectric element. The electronic signal is then brought up for an amplifying uh, circuit. The amplified signal is then brought up to the oscilloscope. The oscilloscope then exports it to the recording computer. The recording computer then analyzes the signal for audacity, creates a spectrum plot. And then it's finally brought to Excel, where I get a numerical value of the average signal amplitude or the average signal strength. So basically, I performed a ball tape analysis where I looked directly at the, at the signal readings and just observed them myself to see what I could uh, get from them that way. And then a quantitative analysis to get a numerical value of the differences between the trials. So as you can see here, this is a great subglottal recording. And here, there's no nodule present. Here, there is a nodule present for these, for these respective tests. As you can see, basically, this, in a nutshell, this line is more squiggly than that line. That's basically what I'm looking for. I mean, I can't say it any fancier than that. Um, this is true for all of the recordings which I took. So when I did the numerical analysis, here you can see that the green line represents the average amplitude, or the relative amplitude, of the signal taken from test with a nodule present in pink line represents one with no nodule present. And as you can see, for each test that I performed, there was always a higher uh, signal strength for when there was a nodule present. On average, the readings with a nodule received 5.55% more ultrasound 
than the reefs without an audio present. And the recording is taken from the super well in the oral region for much better than um, the reef. Excuse me, the reef is taken from the sub well region. So in conclusion, the device was capable of measuring ultrasound. That was the first big thing that we had to know out of the way. Um, the VLM wasn't going to be an effective model. We had a uh, laryngeal anatomist come in and look at our model to make sure that it was good. And he actually really liked our model. Um, we were very glad about that. And it is a potential diagnostic tool for vocal fold nodules. It can enable early detection of nodules because it was able to detect one that would be relatively small in a clinical setting. And all of the methods were very cost effective as I was able to build the entire transducer for around $50 to $75. And as the potential for use in other areas, such as a patient that has a deviated septum, where we would be able to tell if like, um, a patient had you know, different airflow on one side of their nose than the other, because we would be able to listen to the, uh, to the airflow on the patient's nose. And also, um, we could do a cartilage assessment in a patient's joints, because when we were initially performing assessments with the transducer, we noticed <coughs> wrist, for instance, next to the device created sort of a series of popping noises and perhaps we could perform an assessment on car living on this. Thank you very much. Any questions? Would you need to uh, get established a base level for an individual person before you can tell? This was actually the main um, or I guess the question was, we need to establish sort of a baseline level for what a typical ultrasound signal from a human subject is in the clinical setting. As we haven't conducted a human study yet, we're not 100% sure what that baseline level would be, but what we hypothesize we would need to do is um, I would have to determine sort of an amount of ultrasound per amount of airflow. So to create a ratio between the amount of airflow that the person is exhaling versus the amount of ultrasound that they're creating, and to create that sort of ratio would perhaps um, give us a more determined number. Are you working on a patent for your device? Yes, I hope to patent my device. I, I hope this summer. Um, it's kind of a long process, though, from what I understand. I'd like to get it. How did you specifically come up with the makeup of this device? The question was, how did I come up with the makeup for the device? Um, I'm not sure. Do you mean the, um, the ventilatory laryngeal model? Or yeah, what do you specifically build? What I specifically built myself? Yes. Well, specifically, I actually built the whole thing for the ventilatory laryngeal model. Um, my mentor and I went to Home Depot and we just wandered around for an hour, which is a lot of fun to do with a, an engineer to go to Home Depot. And then um, I went home and I just built a thing based on what we had drawn up on a whiteboard. And um, we really came up with you know the ideas together. So I took it home and really built it myself. Uh, do you think this um, device and this method could be made easily like mass produced and made available to doctors to diagnose this? The question was, would this uh, device be economically feasible, I guess, yeah. practically feasible uh, to be mass produced? Um, yes, I think it would. Um, I mean, I can say that in the lab, my mentor and I were able to build this very cheaply. I mean, I paid for the parts, and it did not cost much at all. It was like, I think it was about $50, 50 to $75 for the whole thing. And as far as like medical equipment goes, that's pretty I mean, of course, we have to get higher quality components for an actual medical device. But based on what I've already built, I think it would be accurate for these videos. If this were to be mass produced, what aspects of the period would be produced? If this were to be, um, I guess the question is if this were to be mass produced, what from this experiment would be utilized? Um, what would most likely be utilized is really the basic concept. The thing is, this concept has never been used or tried or proven before in a medical application. As I said, it's used in industrial applications. 
but really the idea has never been used in medical uh, imaging before. So you basically point some sort of very high frequency detecting microphone at a person breathing and you can tell if you'll be able to tell whether they have nose or not. Hopefully that's the end idea uh, if we conduct a human study. Uh, how long does it take you to, uh, to do the analysis on the sound waves? The analysis, or how long did it take you to do the analysis on the sound waves? Okay. Um, that took a very long time and was quite difficult. Um, I remember at one point I asked my uh, grandfather's engineer, my uncle was a physicist, how the formula work that I was using to create the spectrum plots and they just looked at me and said you don't want to know. Like, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was not their computer program. It's a, I use a, a facet rate trans transform which is a standard spectrum plot technique that's used in audio analysis a lot, uh, very commonly. And um, it took me a long time to do that because there was um, basically there were so many data points that it took a long time for the computer just to run the functions. Um, question? You said it's just based on breathing. What if someone speaks? Does, does that not... Do um, you get no results from that, or does it... Okay, so I, um, the question was, um, the trials that I conducted with my model were based on just sort of an exhalation uh, action instead of an arm breath or a speaking action. Um, would speaking affect the results that are obtained with, with the transducer? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, really, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that would be another experiment to try out. Didn't that the board say it sounded like a little Yes, my mentor who lived on the farm when he was uh, a child said that it sounded like a lamb. Um, but um, there were different trials where the where the device phonated and it didn't, and the end result was always the same. Um, sometimes we kept all the trials where the device was making the noise that it was supposed to, where it was making the speech-like noise. However, when I did the analysis, I found that it really didn't make a difference for what I was looking for. So. I mean, I can speculate that it wouldn't make a difference, but I'm not totally sure, and I think that future research would be necessary. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much for um, Alex Mendez. His project is called Analysis of Immune Responses in RV41 PDL Vaccination with Lymphodepletion in Melanoma. Alex was recognized this year as a finalist for the International Science and Engineering. Then 
the T cells will die. They won't be activated and they'll just become useless. So uh, this is a more detailed diagram. So what happens when you get an infection or you get sick is your all your immune cells migrate to uh, lymph nodes. And once they migrate to the lymph nodes, they meet up with another cell that helps activate them. And then after they're activated, they uh, undergo maturation and then they attack the uh, site of infection or uh, the virus, or in this case, uh, the tumor. So uh, I looked at a lot of previous studies before I came up with my hypothesis, and uh, one study in particular used a co-stimulatory molecule called 4-1-BBL, and uh, this study showed that 4-1-BBL was effective in uh, treating tumors. Uh, so these are two uh, charts from the study. The first shows uh, tumor volume, and all the way on the right is is the uh, virus treating group. Uh, it's a combination of two vaccines. And you can see uh, on the bottom, there are two lines, and those two lines represent mice. And for each line represents a single mass. And by the end of the study, uh, two out of these two mice were completely tumor free. So uh, the tumor had regressed. Um, the second shows, uh, it, it basically tells us how the concentration of a certain T cell. and. Uh, so based on that study and others, we chose to use vaccinium virus, which is a smallpox virus. It's a derivative of smallpox virus. And uh, we also chose to use 4-1-BBL. And our last method was uh, lymphodepletion. And now lymphodepletion is something that's new. All the other stuff is, has been tried before. But uh, what lymphodepletion does is it gets rid of the patient's entire immune system. And although this might seem counterintuitive because we're doing an immune study, uh, what this does is it depletes a uh, population of cells known as Treg cells. Uh, your body has Treg cells naturally to uh, down-regulate your immune response when, so you don't develop autoimmune diseases or autoimmune uh, uh, chronic -like disorders. But the tumor, for some reason, upregulates Treg as a self-defense mechanism, and that inhibits your body's own natural immune response and also any immune response that you try to achieve with a vaccine or in like clinical studies. So the hypothesis was that uh, the control group would respond less than the uh, vaccinated group. And so this is uh, the experiment design. Uh, you can see the mouse, uh, it's a healthy mouse. And then we inject it with cancer. And then after we inject it with cancer, some of the mice get lucky and they get to get injected with the vaccine. And so we inject some of them with the vaccine and then they, uh, hopefully they live, and hopefully their tumor doesn't grow at such a rapid rate. And so we used 60 mice and uh, seven different groups, and there were 15, well, there were 60 mice in total, different numbers in each group. So uh, on day four, we inject them with the virus, and we also give them the lymphodepletion to get rid of the T-Rex. Um, these are just methods and materials. Basically, um, I got the mice after they had been sacrificed, and I got the spleen and the tumor, and then I perform a uh, single cell suspension, which just gets the cells down. It, you get a whole spleen, and you want to get it down to each cell by itself. So these are materials for that. And so first, let's look at the uh, average tumor area growth. And uh, average tumor area growth on the bottom is the in the magenta, I guess, uh, with the, the circles. That's the uh, combination treated group. So that group had the uh, strongest response. And this was, this just validated the hypothesis that they had a uh, stronger physical response. The tumor wasn't growing at such a rapid rate. And all the way on the left is, with the blue and the diamond, is uh, PBS, which is just the unlucky mice, and they get saline solution. Um, so that was the average. This is each mouse individually, each square, or circle, or, or uh, triangle, or diamond represents a single mouse. And you can see that all the way on the right, the uh, group titled RB4 and BBL plus TBI. That's our combination group. That's the group that we hope would achieve the strongest response. They're all clustered together at the bottom, meaning that it wasn't just a general trend. Uh, the significant majority of the mice, except for one, I guess, was below 100 millimeters squared in tumor area. So that just validated my hypothesis more. Um, next, we looked at uh, flow cytometry. Now, flow cytometry is a way for us to measure specific immune cells. So we know that the tumor is shrinking, but we want to know why it's shrinking. We want to know what your body is producing and what cells are actually attacking the cancer. So 
what you do is you get the cells and you stain them with an antibody, <coughs> and this antibody uh, is, is a different color, so it could be red, it could be green, it could be purple or yellow. And uh, you put it into this machine, and the machine takes a little tube and then uh, puts it on a computer screen, and each dot is a single cell, so there's about, there's two million cells in each uh, graph, and then uh, based on the different colors and different stains, it'll tell us what the different cells are. So uh, we look for basically the helper cells and the killer cells. Uh, CD8 is a killer T cell, um, and CD4 is a helper T cell, and these are the two like most basic immune, immune cell, T cell populations you have in your body. Um, we also wanted to look at, as I mentioned before, the Treg population to see if it was lower in the groups that were treated with the uh, lymphodepletion. And then on the bottom, we looked at the CD8 effector T cells. Now these are T cells that are specific to the tumor. So uh, what we found is that there was an upregulation in the 4-1 BBL groups with the virus shooter groups, the group that we wanted to see an upregulation in. There was more CD8, there was also more CD4, and more importantly, in the total body irradiation or lymphodepletion treated groups, there were significantly less uh, Treg cells. Um, and next we looked at the tumor. Now we looked at, in this slide, we looked at the spleen, and now we look at the tumor, and the reason for this is because your immune cells migrate to your spleen to get activated. So we wanted to see that the body was having sort of a general immune response, but also that it was having a tumor-specific immune response. Um, so this is day 21 spleen, and this is day 21 tumor, and the results were uh, more of the same, although the the cell populations weren't as large, but relatively speaking, the results were uh, statistically significant. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, the overall CD8 T cell population was greater, and the CD8 T cell population, um, effector T cell populations was uh, greater. And uh, one thing we noticed was that the ratio of CD4 to CD8 is reversed in the virus-treated mice. Uh, my mentor and I, and Everyone else in the lab didn't really know what this meant, but it's interesting. Um, in the future, we're going to do another study to determine systemic immunity. And uh, what this will do is, uh, in the long run, we hope that you'll be able to get a vaccine like a human with uh, cancer. We'll be able to get a vaccine um, after they have the cancer because these vaccines are very potent and we don't want to, them to develop disorders. But uh, they'll get a vaccine, and then the vaccine will be injected. And if it's not strong enough, at first, probably we'll combine it with uh, chemotherapy. But the problem with chemotherapy is that it's not 100% effective. Uh, sometimes the tumor will pop up. It'll start growing again six months later, a year later, two years later. And so the ultimate goal is that your body will develop a systemic immunity. So that means that it'll be able to... Uh, fight off the cancer after a chemotherapy treatment, so you won't have to keep going back and, and getting more treatments and getting something that's really destructive on your body. And like you lose your hair, your immune system goes, and as uh, the keynote speaker said, you are prone to significant bleeding, which can kill you. Um, so we're gonna test the systemic immunity in the future. Uh, thank you. Uh, even cancer, your immune cells become activated. 
Yeah. We do it after. We inject the vaccine after we give them the irradiation. So we deplete their innate immunity. There's a couple of things that the depleting does. First off, it, um, there's these things called cytokine sinks. So to get activated, besides the two, the two signals I mentioned in the beginning, there's also different chemicals that help activate the T cells. And what this does is it depletes your innate immunity, which won't help you at all against the tumor, to uh, make room for these new uh, cells that will be produced when you get injected with a vaccine that are tumor specific and can directly attack the tumor. So we do it after. We, we give them the irradiation and then we inject them with the vaccine. And they won't attack anything else? The, two, the T cells? They're, they're tumor specific. You have general T cells, but they're, we're hoping to upregulate the tumor specific ones. Any side effects? Uh, well, last year I did a human study and that was really successful. This is more like an experimental, trying new things, but one, two patients lived uh, for, one patient lived for like four and a half years after vaccination, and it was a stage four uh, terminal, like it was only had uh, two months to live, and then another patient lived three years, but the, a lot of the vaccines, the stronger ones, the patients develop autoimmune disorders, and they get something called vitiligo, which is an autoimmune, um, like you get a rash on your skin, so um, we're, there are some side effects, but I mean, Living with uh, vitiligo is a lot better than dying from cancer. And so radiation is the first step of the, the suppressing the Yeah. And, yeah. And, and so the virus vaccination, that's not called chemotherapy, that's like... No, that's called, um, vir that's just called, we just, cancer vaccines. So let's see what it means. Um, well, they're not, it's not like an immunosuppressive drug, it's not like something that the system keeps, it's just like a sort of like knockout, so it gets rid of their immune system, immune cell at that time there. It's not like such a compromising uh, dose that you need to get, because when your immune system goes down enough, sometimes in humans and in mice, you need to get bone marrow transplants to rebuild your immune system, but the dose we give them isn't um, enough to deplete it that much. So it's just a sort of like general knockout to get rid of what we hope are like the immune cells that aren't going to help you at all, or aren't going to help the mice. Just what's your next step? Uh, go to college. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, my lab moved, I'm going to Columbia, and my lab was at Columbia, but they moved to Mount Sinai. So maybe I'll try and get like a fellowship, but uh, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. The research continues without me. <laughs> Thank you. Tissue as self or non-self forms the basis for the rejection of life-saving transplants in human beings. Our recognition plays an important role in transplantation. For instance, if, patient, if a patient is receiving a kidney transplant, there are two possible things that can happen in terms of the transplantation um, failing. The first scenario is that the recipient will reject the kidney, which in this case, the doctors will use immunosuppression and shutting off the immunity selectively to uh, avoid this issue. The second thing that can happen that uh, is not very well known is that the graft itself, the kidney, will reject the, the patient. And that results in something called graft versus host disease. It's very dangerous, it shuts down your organs and ruins your skin, etc., and it, one in eight people die from it. Now, the current research on this phenomenon focuses on understanding the mechanisms of allo recognition in humans through a model organism called Hydroctinia symbiology carpus. And concurrently, to fully comprehend this phenomenon at the level of genetic analysis. The ultimate goal of this research is to discover the genes that control allo recognition, and through this understanding, apply this phenomenon and this will result in uh, increasingly, su increasingly successful bone marrow and organ transplants in human beings. So this is the uh, model organism that I was working with. It's called Hydroctinia symbiology carpus. It's a hydrozoan cholendrate, and it is a sessile marine invertebrate, meaning that it uh, lives in salt water and it's immobile. So many of them uh, 
on live on hermit crab shells. Um, the hydrozone coelentrate is a colonial species, meaning that it consists of polyps growing as an attached colony. This is a polyp. It's uh, you know a few millimeters tall. It's very small, but you can see it with the naked eye. And a colony is a group of these polyps growing together that uh, kind of are considered as one species. Hydrictinia symbology carpus is polyps are tall and bullet shaped with a large surface area and a small volume. A polyp consists of a mouth, tentacles, column, manubrium, and petal disc. Now, it is known that the hydrictinia are capable of allo recognition, but it is not known whether the larva, also known as planula, are capable of doing so. Now, this study investigates whether the larva are capable of, capable of allo recognition and whether this affects their decision making process when they are metamorphosing into a polyp. Now, let me explain that last thing uh, in, more, in more depth. A larva is a free-moving, swimming organism. It's very small, and it looks like that. It's a planula. And it swims around until it finds a substrate that it finds suitable for itself to live on as a sessile marine organism. And it'll attach its head to the substrate and metamorphose into a polyp, which is shown in step three. Inhabited hermit crab shells are very common substrates for the planula to settle on, leading to the hypothesis, which is that um, if the larvae of the Hydrictinia symbology carpus are manually introduced to related and unrelated adult colonies on the hermit crab shells, then they will show the ability to allo recognize, and they will be more likely to settle on the shells with related colonies. So, to break this down, what I'm saying is that if a planula goes, um, you know, runs into a shell with a colony that is related to it, it'll A, recognize that that col colony is related to it, and B, it'll be more likely to settle on that colony, um, sorry, on that shell because that colony is related to it. It has someone that is genetically similar to it, thus it is less of a risk for them because that uh, akin is less threatening to you. There's less of a chance that it'll overtake you and um, replace you uh, sexually, and evolutionarily speaking, if you can't reproduce, then you're useless. <laughs> kind of harsh. <laughs> evolutionarily speaking. So, um, the first step of this was breeding. I had to breed the animal in order to run my experiments. Now, in the wild, the hydroctinia release the contents of their gonophores, which is the buds that produce sperm or eggs in the hydroctinia polyp, when they are exposed to light in the morning. So, um, once I uncover the tanks, uh, 40 minutes after I uncover the tanks, the females will drop the eggs and the male will drop, 20 minutes afterwards, the male will uh, release the sperm. After, once I collected the sperm and the eggs, I put the sperm into, the, uh, into a Petri dish containing, containing the eggs, and, on, and the water was changed for the planula every day, and for the purpose of this experiment, I used three-day-old planula. Uh, day of breeding is day one, so it's really they're, they're two days old. I'm not sure why it works that way. The figure shows uh, the six crosses that I made, and really the only important thing to differentiate between all the you know all these different types of of hydrochinia is to know that uh, one and two uh, are related to H50, and three, four, five, and six are unrelated. So. Also, I used, uh, for the experiment itself, the final phase, I used 16 shells uh, with LH50 colonies attached to them. Um, to do this, colonies were explanted near the orifice of the shell. Now, each shell was placed into an individual Petri dish in 29 parts per thousand salt water. Then, the planula were placed in direct physical contact with the colony on each shell using a glass pipette meaning I literally picked it up, uh, the planula, under a dissecting microscope and placed it up on the colony and then observed its movements. Each planula's movement was observed under a dissecting microscope and recorded every five minutes until the planula began to settle or left the shell. Now this took place across the course of about two weeks uh, considering, you know, watching a planula for a full days. You know, you can't, you can't do 20 of them at the same time. It's, it's very tedious and very meticulous. Now, the results recorded, uh, were recorded on templates used for each shell, uh, one for the dorphus and one for the ventral. Uh, and the charts recorded a lot of other important information. 
for example, they recorded the ID of the shell being used, which was actually just for my organizational purposes, irrelevant to the results. The position of the LH50 colony, which is represented by the, the orange shading. The area ventured by the planula after it was deposited onto the, onto the shell, which is shown by the gray shading, will be very clear on the image. Whether it settled or did not settle, and uh, if it settled, it's bright green, and if it did not settle, it's red. And the type of planula, whether it's related or unrelated, that's in the title, and the age, which is on the top of every template. The age, I say, because I said I'm going to use day three planula, but for two of my trials of my 16, I needed to use day four old planula because I did not have day three, and uh, that actually is included in my source of error, which I will explain later. I also included in this chart the rate at which the planula moved. Um, a blue dot represents a fast-moving planula, and a brown dot represents a slow-moving planula. And at the top of the shell, oh, I mentioned that. Okay, so. <clears throat> so these are my results. Uh, these are the templates, and I'm going to go through all of them. But you know, I'll just kind of run quickly run through the story of every one. Not every one, but a few of them. For example, on um, I used you know the Y90 shell here, and I had a day four old planula, and uh, this is the area ventured by the planula, and I deposited you know right on the colony, and it ended up settling green. The second one did not settle. It explored a large part of the shell. Uh, it was fast moving, so it wasn't very interested in the colony. And the third one, you know, explored a large portion of, uh, sorry, a small portion of the shell near and around the colony. So this one explored a large portion of the shell, slow moving. That one uh, liked the area around the colony and settled, and the other one rapidly left the shell. And these are the last two related. Now for the unrelated, this was the only one that settled. And a lot of the other ones seemed to stray off of the colony. And whether they were fast moving or slow moving, they liked to jump off the shell many times. So, so, summary results. Um, for the related, um, you could see that, I, I, you can, maybe you saw, four of them uh, settled and four of them did not settle. For the unrelated, one settled and seven did not settle. Now, in terms of the area ventured by the planula themselves, you, can, you could have seen in the related that they were uh, very interested in the, they're very interested in the areas around the colony. The unrelated, however, were less interested in the areas around the colony. They seemed to explore larger, on average, a larger portion of the shell and were more inclined to rapidly leave the shell. Also, you know, the, the time that the planula were exploring the shell while they were, while they were on, uh, after I placed them, uh, it was different. On, on average, the time it took more time for the related to make a decision. <clears throat> now, the results um, from the uh, final phase in which related planula settled more than unrelated planula suggest that the planula are capable of allo recognition. Half of the related planula, four out of eight, settled on the shell, and of the unrelated planula, only one settled. Now, this result is suspect because the planula trial one was a four-day-old. Four-day-old planula are more likely to settle than three-day-old planula because by day four, the food resources that they have from the lipids uh, are depleted, and so they're desperate to settle. Trial one of the related planula is similarly suspect. In future research, in future research only three-day-old should be used. If you were to really you know, take notice of the first trial of each of my, of my graphics, my computerized graphics, you would see that there wasn't a large area explored by each planula. <clears throat> the results support my hypothesis because e they, even though um, the pl related planula showed more interest in, um, in the you know, areas around the colonies, they still on average, you know, in general, they showed similar behaviors in terms of the patterns in which they moved, um, speeds, about half were fast moving, about half were slow moving, but as I said, the unrelated were uh, you know, a little bit faster moving. And um, 
they had the similar behavior, but so many more related, settled, and unrelated. And if you take out the source of error, um, none of the unrelated settled. Also, uh, most of the related planula showed interest in areas around the colonies of the shell, as opposed to the unrelated, who quickly moved on to leave the shell or explore different areas of the substrate. Now, while the results suggest that the planula Now, while this suggests, uh, results suggest that the planula are capable of valor recognition, the sample size is not large enough to derive statistical significance. The results are, however, just what is expected if the planula are performing valor recognition. Recommendations for future research would be to replicate the methodology with a larger sample size and include a quantitative analysis of um, the planula's movement. You know, determine why some of them were fast moving, some of them were slow moving, why some of them rapidly left the shell. Another thing uh, which could be an important factor is using a detailed observation to determine consistent behavioral or morphological interactions between the larva and the colonies, and then compare the results between the related and the unrelated. In conclusion, the results suggest that the hypothesis is indeed correct. Hydrotinia, symbology, carpus, larvae are capable of other recognition, and this will affect the decision-making process when metamorphosing into a polyp. However, future research is needed to be absolutely certain. And I'd like to give a thanks to my mentor, my parents, and Mr. Garbarino. Hello. So, I'm Sarah Henkind, and my project is the effect of simulated eye diseases on the vision of artists and the quality of their work. Before I start, my mentors were Mr. John Murray, who's the head of the art department here at the high school. Um, Dr. George H. Kurz, who's a retired ophthalmologist who greatly helped me defining the eye diseases, and Mr. Garbarino, who is a science teacher extraordinaire. <laughs> um, so throughout history, there have been many cases of famous artists such as Degas and Monet who have been affected by uh, crippling eye diseases such as cataracts, diabetic retinopathy, and macular degeneration. And um, so over time, many, many people thought it was just a style change when in actual fact their artwork did display characteristics attributable to the disease that they had, so the artwork was greatly differed over time because of the crippling eye disease. So I questioned that if um, subjects produced artwork with simulated eye diseases, will their artwork display consistent characteristics attributable to that simulated eye disease? And my hypothesis was that if subjects produce artwork with simulated eye diseases, then their artwork will display consistent characteristics attributable to that eye disease. So a cataract is a clouding of the natural lens. So um, the part of the eye that's responsible for focusing light and producing a, uh, producing a um, clear and sharp image. So basically you get like fuzzy vision and colors get dulled and um, angles get dulled as well. So you can't see as well. Macular degeneration is caused by a hardening of the arteries that nourish the retina. And so basically you get blotchy vision and you only have um, peripheral vision and no central vision. And diabetic retinopathy, um, diabetes affects the circulatory system of the retina. So um, what happens is, is that you get only tunnel vision and no peripheral vision. Um, Degas is one artist who I mentioned earlier who suffered from eye diseases. He had cataracts, as you can see here, his artwork is very clear. The uh, colors are very bright. The lines are very sharp, and you can clearly see what the image is. This is 30 years later when he was affected by cataracts. As you can see, the colors are very dulled. The um, image is very harsh. The line strokes are very, very harsh. You can see everything that, all, like, all the difficulty he took into making this artwork, whereas before, it obviously came very easily to him. So, um, Subjects who were um, taken from the high school, from the art department, wore safety glasses that were modified to simulate the eye diseases of cataracts, diabetic retinopathy, and macular degeneration. And the impairment glasses were labeled as A, B, and C for cataracts, diabetic retinopathy, and macular degeneration, respectively. These were cataracts, the cataract simulation glasses. They were simulated, they were made by um, scratching steel wool onto the surface of the eyeglasses. So this is, on, on, the, uh, on the left, is a picture of the um, cataract impairment glasses, what they looked like, and on the right is what somebody would have seen while wearing them. 
Diabetic retinopathy was made by punching a hole in a piece of paper and sticking that hole into the middle of the eyeglass and then painting around it. So what you see is what the artist would have seen and what the eyeglasses look like. As you can see, there's tunnel vision and no peripheral vision. And macular degeneration was basically the opposite. It was done by outlining a nickel and coloring that outline in with paint. And then, so you only have peripheral vision and no central vision. And that's what the artist would have seen. And obviously, it's very difficult to see. And then, objects that were unfamiliar to the artist's visual memory were chosen for the artists to draw. Because if you just gave them a apple to draw, they would automatically know to draw a generic apple and not the apple that was actually in front of them. So they wouldn't draw detail. So the objects were Object W, which was a toilet wand because no teenager knows what that is. And <laughs> Object X was a, um, a paperweight slash statue. Object Y was a um, paper displayer. And Object Z was a carabiner. And then a box what called a um, neck movement restricting box was designed so that the artists would not poss would um, hopefully not cheat by looking around their impairment because the glasses, they would probably go like that and that was undesired in the experiment. So that platform is where the artist, is where the object would be placed and that hole is where the artist would look into and then next to that they would draw their object. And that's an example of me looking through the box. Um, and then subjects were recruited from the art department from the high school, and an incent form was obviously con um, obtained. And then subjects were assigned to one of the four objects with one of the four with one of the eye diseases. So they would have five minutes to draw this object with one of the eye diseases, and then they would do this four times. So one time with each of the impairments, and then one time without anything, without any eye diseases as a control. So you could tell what their normal artwork was like. And then art teachers from the district were recruited to evaluate the artwork. So they used a specialized rubric which um, asked them what they thought that the, what they thought the artwork was, um, that the artist had and how the artwork was affected by it. And so, um, so they evaluated that. So the accuracy of classification chart is really the most important chart of this experiment. Um, it displays the accuracy of classification per eye disease and it's separated into four categories for the control, cataract, diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration. And um, in the end, cataracts proved to have the most easily identifiable of all the, ex of all of the, um, of all the eye diseases, including the control. So that means that the art teachers were able to identify which artists had cataracts the most easily, possibly because cataracts is so incredibly, um, like, it's so incredibly deterring to the artwork that it's the most identifiable. Accuracy by adult rater measured the number of correct classifications by each adult rater. So um, this proved that some people, everybody views art differently because some had more correct classifications than others. Yeah. And accuracy by students evaluates the number of times an artist's work was classified correctly. And there was an instance where one subject's artwork was classified more correctly than others which could have meant that, they're superior, that they had superior drawing abilities, which made their artwork more easily identifiable. Um, it was originally anticipated that the teachers would be able to identify a change in the artwork when there was an impairment affected, that affected the artist. Um, so the results suggested that there was a positive effect by diagnosis because there were total 50, out of a total of 58 correct classifications. And a P, the p-value, which is what we used to base our experiment on, was um, 0 0.99, which means this, the results were statistically insignificant, although they're still important because it's still important to identify which eye disease that the artist had and how it's identifiable in the artwork. Um, yeah, so I, I explained all of them. Um, and although the results proved to be statistically insignificant, they're still valuable because the data supports the hypothesis. Um, some errors that could have occurred was that the people, was that the subjects cheated by looking around the impairment, and or they viewed the object which they were not supposed to do before they were supposed to draw it, which could have affected what was in their visual memory. Um, there was also an accidental consistency with the pairing of the of the um, glasses and the object, 
of NW, which means no impairment with object W, um, was used more than the other assignments and this is completely accidental, although in the end it did not affect the results. Um, and it was realized after the conclusion of the study that the adult, one of the adult raters had completed the form incorrectly and that the results had to be discarded. <laughs> um, a future study could evaluate the reason for cataracts being classified correctly so often, more so than the other eye diseases. And um, certain teachers graded the artwork more correctly than other teachers, proving that people view art differently, which is also important to note. Um, I would like to thank Mr. Garbarino and my mentors, um, Dr. Kurz and Mr. Murray. References. I know oh, yeah. I would have that never word. been able to pronounce it ever. <laughs> All right, our final presentation tonight um, is by Nifert Bassman, and let's see if I can do this right. The ABC model in Aristolochiaceae <laughs> family, Woo! confirming genetic patterns across floral evolution. And I'd like to mention that Nifer was recognized this year as um, an Intel semifinalist and as a finalist at in the International Science and Engineering Fair. So. All right, so hi, I'm Never, uh, I'm Never Fassman, and as Willa mentioned, the title of my project is the ABC model in the Aristolochiaceae family. And the idea behind this complicated title is that one of the overall goals of plant sciences is to understand how all plants are related to each other. What, what do they have in common? How have they changed throughout history? And one of the ways scientists have of doing this is this thing called the ABC model. And the idea is that the ABC model explains how genes interact with each other when flowers are developing. The problem with this model is that this model is supposed to apply to all flowering plants, but it was developed based on plants that evolved relatively recently. It was developed based on two, two plant species, Arabidopsis thaliana, which is the general test plant for flower studies, and Angerina magus, which is the snapdragon. Both of these plants evolved relatively recently in evolutionary history. So the goal of my project was to look at plants that were some of the first flowering plants to evolve and to confirm that the predictions made by the ABC model worked across flowering plant evolution. So the idea is that the Aristolochiaceae family, they're basal angiosperms. They were some of the first flowering plants to evolve. So what is the ABC model? The idea is that the ABC model groups the genes responsible for flower development into three categories, A, B, and C. The idea is, is that if, you have, if you, have a, you have a seed and it's becoming a flower, and you have, you have cells and they're growing, but right now when they start off, they're undifferentiated. They don't know what they're going to become. So the idea is if you have A-class genes present within that cell, that cell will become a sepal. But if you have both B and A class genes present at the same time, it will become a petal, and so on throughout the model. And the idea is this, this model, which explains how genes interact, could be the starting point for future genetic studies. The problem is we have to first confirm that it does really apply to all flowering plants. So specifically, I was looking at four genes from the ABC model. I was looking at fruitful-like, sepalata, apetala-3, and pistolata and I was looking at their expression within three species from the Aristolochiaceae family. I was looking at Aristolochia fimbriata, Ceruma henry, and Asarum europaea. So specifically, I wanted to see these four genes, where are these, they being expressed in these three species, and does the, this expression match what is predicted by the ABC model? In other words, do these genes have the same role in the older plants and in the newer plants? Um, one, of the, one of the things with this project is the it wasn't one set of methods that I did each step once. For each gene within each species, there was a method cycle that had to be repeated each time. So this slide right here summarizes the method cycle. The idea is samples were collected, I messed with their DNA for a while, I ran it through a process called gel electrophoresis, and then I was able to look at the DNA and see what was going on. On the next couple of slides, I can explain, I'm going to explain what each of these steps means more specifically, but this is an overview of what happened each time I ran the process. So the first step is collection. I needed samples to work with. I was lucky enough to be working at the New York Botanical Garden, where all of these three species were, were growing. The uh, Asar near Pan and Sruma Henry both grow in the rock garden at the New York Botanical Garden, and Aristolochia fimbriata grows in the greenhouse there. So I was able to collect live samples, which is often a problem in plant studies. Can you get live samples, or do you have to work with dried samples? I was lucky. 
Um, so, but, but one of the problems is each of these three plants, what's so cool about the Aristolochiaceae family is these three flowers, you can see, they look completely different. Cerumba henry, it's a typical flower. It's got a stem, leaves, petals. It's very pretty. Asarum europaeum is a shrub. It's got no petals. It grows on the ground. It's kind of ugly. And Aristolochia fimbriata is a tropical plant. It grows on vines. And you can see that the sepals and petals have fused to form this tube-like structure. So they're actually, physically they're very different, but they're actually very closely related. But because they're so different, I had to collect different parts from each flower because they had different parts. So Cerumba henry, you can see it has sepals, petals, stamens, carpels. Those are all distinct. Whereas the sarum only has sepals, and Aristolochia has fimbria limb tube. Those are all the different parts you can see in the photo that have fused together. Um, the other thing was because I would be looking at uh, genetic material which degrades very quickly, immediately after the samples were collected, they were stored in liquid nitrogen at negative 80 degrees Celsius to, to freeze what was going on within the flower and keep it steady until I could look at my samples. Uh, the next step was uh, nucleic steps, were nucleic acid manipulation. I was looking at the, what I wanted to do was extract RNA rather than DNA. The reason for this is that DNA is present in every cell but I was only interested in what was being expressed, so that's RNA. RNA is only present when the gene is being expressed, so I extracted messenger RNA. Problem again, next thing I wanted to do was perform a polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. PCR can only be performed on DNA. I had RNA, so I took the RNA and I performed a reverse transcription to convert the RNA into cDNA. Finally, I was able to do the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. PCR is a really useful tool. It creates a lot of copies of a very short segment of DNA very quickly. So I was able to have, DNA is microscopic. I needed enough of a sample to actually visually see whether the sample was present. The next step was to run these PCR products. They were stored until I could run them through a gel electrophoresis. I used a 1% agarose gel, 96 volts, let it run for 35 minutes, and then I soaked the gel in ethidium bromide. Ethidium bromide binds to DNA, it also fluoresces under UV light. So I was able to take those gels out of the ethidium bromide, photograph them under UV light, and then there would be glowing bands if the DNA was present. So you'll see that on the next slide. Those final photographs with the glowing bands, those were analyzed by hand. If there was a band, the gene was being expressed. If there was a black hole, no gene being expressed. Um, they also, it was very important with this experiment, because I was working in a lab with many other scientists, one of the big problems or, or fears is that there will be contamination, that I will get DNA from another scientist's experiment into my experiment. So on each of the pictures you'll see on the next slide, the last column will be a negative control column. As long as that column is clear, that means there's less of a chance that there was contamination from another project into my project. So these are the final results. You can see they're grouped by species. So the top is Aristolochia fimbriata, the next is Sruma Henry, and the final slide will be a Sarum Europaeum. The idea is that the, the abbreviations right here, these are the names of the genes, and underneath are the names of all the floral parts. So if you see a bright band, you can look, okay. Fimbria, Pistolata Aristolochia fimbriatus. That means within the Aristolochia fimbriata flower, the Pistolata gene is being expressed in Fimbria because there's a bright band, and so on throughout the entire column. And what you can see from these results is if you, knew, if you look in the right places, you can see that the bright bands match what is predicted by the ABC model. So if you go through, and if you see here in the last column, that negative control column is clear, which is what you always want to see, make sure there's no contamination. Great, great, really strong results. I found of, of the four genes I looked at, two of them were exactly where I thought they would be. The ABC model predicted you will find them genes in this, 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 and this floral part, that's exactly where I found them. That was true for pistolata and sepalata. They were both found where I predicted. The two questions came with fruitful-like and apetalic free. In the case of fruitful-like, fruitful-like is supposed to be an A-class gene, meaning it's only found in sepals and petals. The problem is I found it expressed everywhere. So going back into the literature, reading, trying to figure out why this is, it turns out that while I was doing this experiment, there was other scientists testing at the same time. They were just looking at other plant families from different places in evolution, and they were also finding that fruitful life was expressed everywhere. It turns out, the, as I said at the beginning, this original ABC model based on Arabidopsis thaliana, Arabidopsis thaliana was used because it's a very general plant in many ways, it's the test plant, but it turns out in the case of fruitful life, this one specific gene, it's totally unique. So the fact that I found fruitful life exp expressed everywhere actually confirms the results of other scientists. In the case of Apetala 3, 
Sometimes it was expressed where I thought it would be, sometimes it wasn't. Uh, a couple of possible results for this, either it's human error, I didn't have enough of a sample size, or uh, there was contamination in the sample I didn't account for. The other possibility is that evolution, that a pet 3 has a different role in this older plant family than in the newer plant families, which is exactly what I was looking for. Um, in conclusion, the, the, the Madsbox genes, these are the genes that we're looking at, they, there are similarities between these older plant families and the newer plant families. There are definitely the same genes can be found all across these plant families. Uh, the roles of Piscolon and Cipollata were conserved, so they were expressed where I thought they would be, and the roles of Fruitful Lake and Apetal 3 were not conserved. The great news about this is that for two out of the four genes I looked at, the, and in the case of Fruitful Lake, the results were positive, the ABC model is strong. It can predict what's going on within flowers. It means it can be used in future genetic studies, and there's also implications for evolution for how these flowers have changed over time. Um, in the future, I'd love to expand the study to include more kinds of genes. I only had A-class genes, B-class genes, and E-class genes. I'd love to include a C-class gene. I'd also love to expand the study to include more species within Aristolochiaceae. I happen to have samples for Aristolochia trilobata, Aristolochia salvadorensis, uh, Sarum cadatum, and Sarum canadense, and I'd really love to expand the study to include those species. Um, yeah, a lot of people worked on this before I did, so thank you to their papers, which really helped me in formulating my study. And uh, I do need, my acknowledgement slide got cut out because I use this at ISAF and you're not allowed to thank people, but thank you so much to my mentors, uh, Dr. Amy Litt at the New York Botanical Garden and Natalia Pavonora at the Botanical Garden. Thank you to Mr. Beverino, I don't know if he's here in the other room, and thank you to my parents because he put up with me. <laughs> Any questions? But plants change over time. There's mutations or there, there's evolution outside pressures. The, 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 a gene that, a, a floral part that was needed here at one point might be needed in another part of the plant if it's located in a different geographical location or if there's different environments. So plants change over time depending on what their environment is like. I was just, I wanted to see this core group of genes that, that does this very specific function. It hasn't really changed over time, which is actually more interesting than if it had. And that's what I was looking to see is, is scientists believe this core group of genes hasn't changed much. Is that really true? Any other questions? So would there be any benefit to, um, you know, to, to these mutations? Um, I actually wasn't looking so much at what they were doing mm -hmm. as I wanted to see if they were there. And I'm leaving it up to other scientists right. to know what they do. I just wanted to know if they were there to even go exploring after. Sarah. What inspired you to do this? What inspired me to do this? Um, I read an article about research being done at the New York Botanical Garden, and I had no idea that the Botanical Garden had labs. I thought it was just a garden. I had no idea. There are world-class laboratories at the New York Botanical Garden. I became fascinated by the fact there was research being done there. I started reading journal articles and talking to scientists, and I ended up here. Were you there at the Pfizer facility? Is that yeah. where you were? I was, yes, I was at the Pfizer lab. It's a great lab. If you get a chance to visit the garden, pop back there. It's really, it's in a back corner. It's kind of hard to see, but it's a beautiful building. Yeah. Any other questions? What made you use those three specific uh, ones, other than the fact that they're you know, generally? Is it because other scientists use them? Uh, the question is, why did I look at those three specific species? Two reasons. I, I, I knew from the start that I needed to use a family of basal angiosperms, meaning flowers that were the first flowering plants to evolve. I used this specific family of basal angiosperms because at the time when I was developing my study, there happened to be a graduate student in the lab, uh, a morphologist whose specialty was the Aristolochiaceae family. And she had predicted that this would be a good family for genetic studies, so it was great. I was able to test her hypothesis, and she's going to be able to use my results in her own papers, which is really positive that we can all share the results.
to have one more quick hand for Alex and Jade and Robbie. I'd also like to thank all of our parents and guests, siblings, for coming out and staying this late to uh, recognize all our kids' work. It's really nice that the kids who are presenting later don't uh, see the audience just disappear. So really thank you. Thanks for uh, being here.